um, if people remember what happened during the 20th century when human life was not respected. So this kind of anti-human perspective of the environment is something that is reverting to the past. My name is Mike Maselli, and this is The Energy Show with REI Energy, where we're energizing your investments and maximizing your tax deductions. Today, we're going to be talking about voters are left to guess on energy. And Kamala won't discuss the energy policies. The media won't ask her about her energy policy. So today, we're going to dig into what will likely happen to energy if Kamala is elected president. My guest today is Gabriella Hoffman. Gabri Gabriella is the director of for the Center of Energy and Conservation at Independence Women's Forum. Great to have you on the show today, Gabriella. Thanks for having me. Good to talk to you about energy. It's a very exciting topic. Wish it got more coverage, but happy to break down what's trending in energy with you today. Well, Gabriella, we have a lot to unpack today. <laughs> I mean, Where do Kamala you want to start? Seems, well, <laughs> let's start with Kamala's energy policies because, you know, when she first got into uh, ran for president, uh, you know, she obviously was against fracking and now she seems to be pro fracking. So I just wanted to kind of get your opinion on on her on her energy policies. <laughs> I'm actually led to believe that she's not for fracking because of the non answer. It, it leads me to believe she doesn't understand it or doesn't want to say she supports it or doesn't articulate why she supports it. So I think anyone who is uncertain about where she stands that uncertainty is warranted because she's not clear or rather if you look more so at her past and what her administration has done whether it is to you know broadly natural gas or liquefied natural gas uh, as recent as february her administration put a stop and a pause to future export terminals uh, lng terminals because it was not in their mind in the public interest to do it they were consulting climate activists from TikTok and professors who are very heavily biased against natural gas so just seeing what she's done more recently as part of the Biden-Harris administration, and even going back to day one or the first week, uh, the Biden-Harris administration said, we're going to be issuing an executive order to tackle the climate crisis in their view, not my words. And that includes phasing out fossil fuels almost entirely, if not entirely, economy-wide by 2050. So that leads people, that should lead people to believe that fracking would not be part of the equation. It's largely going to be a future if they were to succeed in their agenda, but net zero is not working, as a lot of people are seeing, due to all this spending and just the various different inefficiencies and shortcomings that come with intermittent sources that can't replace reliable baseload power. Um, so people can see broadly and more specifically to her positions on fracking as it relates to net zero, it's an inauthentic position. I would be more convinced of her having an awakening if she actually went to Northwest Pennsylvania, for instance, where the Marcella shale is. She dons a construction hat meets with the energy workers and said, you know, I'm here to reassure you, your jobs will not be sacrificed under any future energy platform I have. Wait, I don't get that reassurance. I've been to Northwestern Pennsylvania. The, the fracking guys there are very distrustful of people like her. So if you have the energy workers saying, we don't trust her, we know her record, it leads me to believe, you know, from a multitude of factors, her record, their skepticism of her. She's just saying it to, to think she can win Pennsylvania. It's a political, convenient position she's taking. So I don't think she's warmed up to fracking whatsoever. I think because of checks and balances and just the threats of lawsuits by energy companies has made this administration not entirely phase out these processes. Because according to different laws, um, natural gas development is within the public interest. The Nat Natural Gas Act, I forget what year, uh, from the 70s or 80s says that developing natural gas is within the public interest. It's safe. It's perfectly acceptable to do. So we have laws that protect this type of energy development which has led to fewer emissions and lots of jobs and careers sustained and, and a you know a cleaner environment as well. People forget that these industries fracking too, the, the workers and, and the company heads are very careful of trying to despoil the environment. A lot of these people hunt and fish, so they don't want to see a tainted environment. And so overall, yeah, I don't think she's converted or, or awoken um, to like <laughs> fracking. It's just, it's just a politically expedient thing. She doesn't have anything. She, she claiming that she has all these sorts of views now she's not Biden leads it, it, it's I mean she copied word for word her platform from the Biden 2024 campaign and she yeah. supports net zero so net zero says there's no fracking in the future so who is she intentionally misleading her her base who doesn't want fracking or people in the middle who are kind of skeptical of her so I I don't believe it for a second yeah, no, I agree with you. And a good friend of mine, Robert Kiyosaki, obviously says, pay attention to what people do, not what they say. 
And, uh, you know, if you look back at her policies on the Green New Deal, like you were saying, I mean, basically it's, uh, you know, they're, they're for eliminating fracking. And, and what I don't really understand is that, you know, I don't know that the American people really understand how important oil and gas is to our economy, even the world economy, you know, to, to even, I mean, <laughs> to, to even entertain something like that. I mean, I, I know, you know, if you, if you look at the media, I mean, obviously everything is climate change, you know, we need to do something, of, you know, about climate change, but getting rid of our way of life is, is not the answer, correct? Absolutely correct. And I start to see this, I'm starting to see this language communicated more by people who don't necessarily focus on energy policy as closely as we do, and perhaps your listeners do, but people are moving away from this notion of making energy policy related to climate action and more so one of energy abundance. That's rhetoric and, and language I'm starting to see more and it leads me encouraged because what they're doing, what Biden Harris has done essentially since they've come to office, they've attached their energy policy to the Paris Climate Accords, which says we're going to, in the end, or ultimately reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 1.5 degrees Celsius by going net zero. But there's a fallacy with that because even conservative estimates, uh, uh, let's say that their plan comes to fruition, you fully rid of fossil fuels. Um, you're only going to be reducing temperatures at best 0.2 degrees Celsius, far away from that 1.5 degrees Celsius figure. But in addition to having no measurable benefit to the environment, you're also going to be destroying our GDP, displacing countless people from the workforce and reducing our quality of life. And so a lot of this kind of um, climate oriented environmental policy, energy policy does not want human flourishing. They want this, you know, kind of rewilding. They, they think modern life is too toxic. It's bad. But now that we're here on the landscape, there's 8 billion people in the world. People are starting to see that you need to replenish the population. You have to have a consistent, you know, population growth percentage so people can sustain natural resources and enjoy it. Uh, rather than eliminating people, you don't want to be eliminating people for environmental causes that has very deleterious consequences. Um, if people remember what happened during the 20th century when human life was not respected. So this kind of anti-human perspective of the environment is something that is reverting to the past. And I think more and more people, even those who claim to be progressive or maybe more climate oriented, are seeing that you don't need to trade economic productivity for having a clean and vibrant environment. I, I think those two interests don't have to come at odds with one another. I also think people just have to be cautious. You know, are we in a climate crisis? I don't believe so, because we see fewer deaths attributed to climate change, a 90 some odd percent decrease across the last half century. So things are looking up. We have cleaner air, cleaner water conditions compared to the 70s. I was born in the 90s, so I wasn't here in the 70s. But my understanding, looking at different charts and observations, leads me to believe that we are in a much better position than we were decades ago. And so we also couple that with productivity. So those points could be easily debunked. And, and that's why I think it's important to move away from this fight in climate change. You know, the climate change is naturally, I don't think anyone disagrees with it, but can you say it's fully our fault? What if we're also leading to enhancements? What if we're improving? And, and we are, we're absolutely improving. We're inventing technologies, hopefully dictated by the markets, not government. To say that we can address a solution, you know, maybe a tragedy of the commons solution or how do we, you know, reduce our footprint, you know, even refining coal, oil and gas. And, and today, coal, oil and gas is produced in a much cleaner fashion than it was previously, which is why you see recent polling even suggesting in swing states of all places, the very competitive states, uh, people in Pennsylvania, Arizona, North Carolina, like two thirds of respondents said they want to see more domestic production of coal, oil and gas. And even 63% uh, of those 30 and under as well. So that climate rhetoric is not necessarily sticking with the younger people who are largely more um, gullible or susceptible to buying into those kind of talking points. So you start to see a shift with people, especially those younger people who might have been easily persuadable to buy the climate change rhetoric or the climate alarmist rhetoric. So I'm, I'm optimistic that people do want it. And, and uh, it, it just is a matter of, you know, which of the candidates can articulate such a position well. And we I think everyone can deduce who does a little bit better there. So I read an article that you that you wrote recently, which was talking about nuclear energy. And uh, I think you in the article and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 33 percent of men or more men would, are open to nuclear energy compared to women. Why, why do you think that is? 
I think when women see <laughs> nuclear reactors and they read about, let's say they do initial preening into the topic or research and they see, you know, the, the Three Mile Island incident from 1979 or Chernobyl, which was actually pretty close to where my family is from. My parents fled the Soviet Union before Chernobyl uh, incident occurred. They landed in America a couple of months before. Um, but I always heard about Chernobyl and we were always told, you know, if your family grew up behind the Iron Curtain, you shouldn't like nuclear, which is a really <laughs> illogical position to have. Um, so for me, I always kind of knew as a woman too, that, you know, not largely going off of appeals. I want practicality. And I think a lot of women who are going to be behind, and, and this is why I wrote this blog a few months ago, but I, I've reiterated it recently in some of my more recent writings. Um, but I think the reason why women are maybe immune to or, or reticent to rather understanding the benefits of nuclear is they haven't been presented a case as to why they should like it. Or they buy into the narratives of nuclear explosions. Maybe they see some of the imagery from past political ads about nuclear explosion, or they hear about nuclear arms, you know, relating to foreign conflicts. And they're like, this is very scary. I don't know if I can like this. What is it going to do? Is it going to harm me? going to harm my family? So women, of course, were more sensitive creatures, not saying that makes us wildflowers or, or um, you know, wallflowers or anything of that sort. But I think women will warm up to nuclear. I don't know how you can convert, you know, reactors and the cooling stations uh, architecturally. It's really hard to change the structure there. But maybe if, you know, you're uh, developing like small modular reactors, which are smaller nuclear power plants, there are different concepts out there that make nuclear reactors not look as aesthetically unattractive as, let's say, a conventional nuclear reactor or nuclear power plant looks. There's a company called Oklo that just went public on the New York Stock Exchange that has a prototype, which the Department of Energy has rejected in recent years, but hopefully uh, they're contesting it and, and appealing to get their prototype unleashed. But they're creating small modular reactors, these smaller reactors, to look like ski chalets. So I think, you know, maybe changing the appearance, but still keeping the... the um, basic principles of nuclear, keeping all the, the facets of it, you know, there that could change women because we're visual creatures. We like to see nice looking things. Um, so maybe changing the perception there and not saying you have to retool a nuclear power plant, but I think there's just been a knowledge gap uh, articulated to women, but there are different societies and, and women who work in nuclear energy far more experienced than me or more in, more in proximity to the industry than I am. I'm just an observer from the outside. Um, but there are women working in the field, I think, who are also doing a job to set any, shed any misconceptions about nuclear. But when women realize that it's the least land intensive power plant out there, especially compared to other so-called clean energies like solar and wind, when they see that it works almost 24-7 and has a capacity of 93%, almost to 100% working at maximum power, even when it has scheduled maintenance, and then they see that actually the waste is very safely discarded or reused for small modular reactors or other means and stored safely. Or um, they see the news that uh, nuclear is going to have a, a new kind of purpose for helping power AI data centers. And so when they start to see that more and more people are warming up to it and they start to see that it actually will produce reliable energy, not cause any disasters uh, like in the past. Um, the past failures, I would say, with respect to Chernobyl, that was a central planning failure. That was not a nuclear right. energy failure. And I think people have to go back and, and maybe be explained the history of nuclear is we were actually the first country, if I'm not mistaken, at the University of Chicago in the 1940s to open the first prototype nuclear reactor uh, during you know that time of open Oppenheimer and, and others doing the, the, the respective projects uh, over there studying nuclear and all. Um, so we were a pioneer of nuclear. We just moved away from it because of just media misperceptions, people misunderstanding what it is. And of course, certain disasters can impact people's perceptions, especially women. But now that we see China and Russia scaling up nuclear, building five to 10 plants a year or plans to build dozens of nuclear reactors across the next decade, people are starting to recognize that maybe there was nothing to fear. Or if our adversaries are doing this, why can't we do this better than them? So I think it just takes uh, explaining, m imparting more knowledge to them and showcasing why this is much more preferable. It's going to lead to lower energy costs when it's fully functional um, and, and really can take off successfully because of all just the different benefits. And if if you care about the environment, it, it makes the most sense. It's a no brainer in terms of clean energy. Yeah, it is, you know, one of the site, I mean, one of the cleanest forms of energy and Mm -hmm. Maybe they can start by changing the name and because everybody <laughs> associates nuclear with nuclear bombs. So, mm -hmm. you know, that may start. But when you 
you know, we I got I guess at Three Mile Island, you know, they they've always had one reactor still running, and now mm -hmm. I read recently that they're, they're talking about reopening another reactor there. No, they're going to be reop. Uh, they're not going to be reopening Unit Two, which is the one that had the incident where the accident took place. They're going to be reopening Unit One, and this is a really blockbuster deal to me. And I was kind of thinking about Three Mile Island earlier this year. I was like, maybe they'll somehow bring it on online again. It was I I, I can't say that I predicted it coming back online, but I had a <laughs> feeling like it's going to be somehow brought back into the conversation about nuclear and Constellation, which is the owner of it, um, entered into this deal with Microsoft for 20 years to commence in 2028 if they get all the necessary approval permits um, and other paperwork done. But it seems to be fast going to be fast tracked. The Even the Democrat governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, is like, please fast track the project uh, to one um, utility company that oversees electricity uh, distribution in the region here in the Northeast. And so you even have people like that um, who you don't think to be, you know, conventional nuclear energy supporters, but nuclear is starting to get more, let's say, bipartisan appeal across, you know, the right and the left as well. So I think a lot of people recognize, you know, it's good for the economy. What this deal will do if it successfully comes back online, it's supposed to have a $16 billion economic footprint. There's going to be 3,400 direct and indirect jobs, um, and it's going to power exclusively AI data centers. Although, I'm hoping that the reason why we see a nuclear renaissance is not just simply to power AI data centers. It's a good, reliable baseload power. I don't want it to be just, you know, exclusive to one use or to one industry. It, it should be portable to many different industries. So I'm hoping the government does not just pick winners and losers. They pick, you know, Microsoft or Bill Gates or these particular individuals or the preferred companies to say, okay, we'll approve reactors for you, but we won't approve reactors for others. Uh, because you still have to go through um, approval process through the government. It's not just a, it, it's going to be a private public partnership for the foreseeable future. And it, it anything entailing energy infrastructure is always going to have some little bit of government interference. I wouldn't say interference, but cooperation is more of the term. Um, but I'm hoping that nuclear can get more play in the free market because that's where the public is trending. Consumers want to see this because they see how much solar and wind has failed. It cannot replace coal, oil, and gas. Right now, we still largely consume and produce fossil fuels, and we will for the foreseeable future. That's no mistake. And and, and that's a good thing, because like you said earlier, it, it's essential to quality of life. And I think a lot of people, until they experience a blackout or brownout or some sort of shock in the grid, they will not appreciate these products and byproducts even until, you know, push comes to shove or, or they don't know how to power their home without, you know, natural gas or oil or some sort of fuel source. And I think nuclear down the road, when it's fully unleashed, I don't know if it can replace existing fossil fuels. I don't, um, we'll see what happens there, but I think it's a good supplement and complement to what we already have because it is a baseload power. It's proven to work. It just has had so much misinformation and disinformation attached to it. And so um, I, I like this Three Mile Island deal. I would like to see more private infusion, uh, private involvement um, to really have it catalyzed. And, and we want that. We want to have a vibrant nuclear industry because it's not just the engineers, it's also security uh, personnel. It's also marketing folks. It's going to be people who are directly and directly supported by it. And so it, it's really an exciting time. I wish that it didn't. <laughs> I, I hate that we're playing defense um, and that it takes so long for these you know different yeah. plants to come online. But we should we should have been on the offense, even in spite of some of these horrible incidences. Although Three Mile Island actually did not lead to any deaths. It was just a mismanagement of uh, an error that occurred. And then, you know, people kind of overblow it and say, like, all nuclear reactors are going to be doomed like this. But it did lead to unnecessary closures of a lot of reactors across the country. So now we're having to play catch up. So hopefully we do. And this uh, this example might uh, help us get into the future more um, and, and see more projects like it. I think Tennessee has a, a uranium um, project that's going to be, you know, coming online very soon. And more and more reactors, I think, are planned. So it's an exciting time. And everyone who cares about, you know, reliable baseload power should look very optimistically at nuclear if government yeah, can get out of the way. We've actually been using small reactors in our military ships and our submarines and stuff like that for a while, haven't we? Yeah, I, I believe, um, and I'm not a national security expert. From my understanding, though, there is a national security component because of just, you know, nuclear warheads and, you know, mm -hmm. just, just how much goes into it. And because our enemies are building up nuclear power plants to project, you know, terror towards us or to project, you know, intimidation. Right. And so it, it has um, 
spill over into other areas as well. So yes, it is very tied to national security and seeing our adversaries have more plants than us, uh, I think it's also gotten people to kind of rethink their previous hesitation to go with nuclear. So it, it is involved in a lot of military and national and defense um, options as well. So I think if we have more nuclear energy harness, it could help us with our defense capabilities as well from my basic understanding of, of those particular issues. But it, it does play into a lot of different areas. And, and for our national security, because energy security is national security, I think people forget that. Um, so we don't have to be reliant on others. Having nuclear at our disposal right now, it's responsible for about 19% uh, of electricity generation. We can have a lot more of it. And so um, I, I think, yes, people understand the national security implications if you do not have nuclear harnessed. And so I think people are changing their perception there as well. Uh, well, I agree with you. <clears throat> I think we need more nuclear here in, the, in in our country. And obviously it would create you know clean electricity for not only the data centers, but for you know, the American population as well, and hopefully drive down energy prices. Mm -hmm. But getting back on oil, uh, you know, Trump, of course, he's clearly promoting, you know, more development in oil and gas and, and uh, you know, saying that it's going to bring down prices. I mean, how much impact does oil and gas have on everyday goods? I think it has a big impact. I don't know exactly how to quantify it, but because so much of production, it's not only the energy you consume and produce, people forget that there's a lot of petroleum byproducts too. Also the transportation of food food and fuel um, very much derives from production and consumption. And then also just the derivatives too, as well. If you don't have a vibrant oil and gas industry, a lot of the products we depend upon that are byproducts of fossil fuels, we won't be having those as well. I think that's what people forget when they're calling for phasing out fossil fuels or oil, coal, and gas. Um, because it is so integral to all facets of life. It just doesn't stop, you know, at this, you know, direct level. It also has downstream effects on the derivatives and even the processes, you know, your groceries are going to, your groceries are largely higher because of fuel costs. So those intermediary transport people have to pass on the cost, not because they want to, but because they have to, you know, respond to supply and demand. They have higher transportation costs. Unfortunately, it's going to lead to grocers charging more for food because of just everything being a lot higher in terms of costs. So you have high energy costs, you therefore have high transportation costs, and then also grocery costs. And also the cost of, you know, raising uh, livestock and also produce has gone up because those different uh, equipment, um, whether it's tractor trailers or tractors or trucks or anything used to harvest or to transport, even on the farming and agriculture side, those have gone up too. And, and the climate activists have also targeted them. It's not just the energy producers, they've gone after agriculture, anything that has kind of some association with energy. And so if, if fuel costs and energy costs go down, we're going to see a corresponding decrease in fuel costs. So the transportation is gonna become cheaper. Uh, they could take more supply load. The people transporting the goods will make more money too. My cousin is a truck driver. He transports some goods and he says it's really expensive and not profitable to be a truck driver these days yeah. as an yeah, no, really independent think. operator. And then the grocers will say, you know, we're responding to shocks in the market fuel costs are down, um, perhaps the the energy costs, you know, to to harvest food and to raise livestock has also gone down. So we can respond by saying we're going to charge lower prices as a result. So it's not just, cor it's not corporations, you know, tipping the scales and saying we purposely want, you know, to raise costs. It's people responding to supply and demand and, and inflationary pressures. That's just how it is. It's not them trying to punish us. Like I, you talk to any producer or any person involved they're not purposely trying to raise prices. This is just them responding to the government meddling in these different industries and, and yeah. discouraging domestic production and, and those downstream effects. So if you if you have an administration like we do see with Biden Harris that does not want oil and gas production, like make no bones about it. Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris does not support oil and gas. Again, going back to her net zero pledges and commitments. Um, the only reason why she's saying I'm embracing it now is because she's had to, like I said, because of court challenges, um, different rules that they've passed being blocked by different various federal judges, Congress um, potentially overriding different things, or even just this outside pressure coming from the American public to say, hey, this rule, this regulation is not good. Please reconsider. So they pull certain regulations after negative blowback as well. And so it's not because their administration has a good regulatory framework. Their All their policy has been aimed at discouraging it. They only have had 650 new oil and gas leases, the, the least 
of any administration in recent memory. And then the fewest ever offshore oil and gas auctions. Yeah. I think it was like three, even less maybe, uh, whether it's in the Gulf of Mexico or in Alaska. So people can read for themselves and see that it, it, this administration is not creating a friendly environment to oil and gas. Oil and gas is high, or the, the production is so high because again, they're, they're responding to global supply and demand and just the failure of these intermittent sources, they can't solely power by themselves. So these traditional energy producers have to produce more energy <laughs> to make up for the differences of these faulty so-called alternatives. And so that's why we're seeing more historic levels of production. It's not because of a, a climate inviting such, it's just the, the <laughs> nature of just how energy policy works. It responds to factors outside of regulations too. So regulations can create a hamper and they do, but it's, you know, obviously the markets that dictate, you know, where demand is going. Right. Yeah. Even with LNG, which is liquefied natural gas, obviously they killed one of the biggest plants to be built to date. And, you know, that's strange because natural gas is probably one of the cheapest forms of, mm -hmm. of fossil fuels that we have. I mean, you know, they, in some areas they can't, they can't even give it away because it's such a byproduct of oil and gas. So we have a tremendous amount of reserves of natural yes. gas and, and yet, you know, they want to kill the liquefied natural gas plants. <laughs> it's preposterous. And funny enough, you mentioned that I was just in Lithuania where my parents are from. I was in the seaport town where there is an LNG import terminal. Mm -hmm. And after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we were supplying in 2022, two thirds of their LNG supply. Now we don't supply it as much. Norway supplies the most, but we were, we had so much in the ground of liquid gold as president Trump calls it, but of molecules of freedom as his, for, as his administration dubbed it. We have so much supply, so many, I think it's trillion cubic feet of unprocessed or untapped liquefied natural gas. We can supply our friends in these really hardened regions of the world. I mean, we could, we could furnish and supply energy for our folks here. Of course, that's paramount. We have so much in excess, we can help people wean off, you know, reliance from China, Russia, yeah. Iran. And that's what we have to be as a net exporter of energy. And we were approaching that. And, and we still do export a lot of LNG, but it doesn't help that we have horrible policies or very terrible kind of misguided policies that say, keep it in the ground in perpetuity uh, because we want unreliables rather than, you know, going with what works. So we, we have a big task at hand to continue to do it. And again, we can do it safely, responsibly without any dent to the environment. And we do because we have basic regulations that say, why would we want to taint our water supply? Why would we want to taint soil? Why would we want to make life worse for everyone with production? So everything can be balanced out very smartly where both the environment and people's livelihoods and productivity don't have to be you know, at odds with one another. Well, I agree with you. We certainly need to change. Gabriella, it was certainly nice having you on the show today, and I'd love to have you come back because I wanted to kind of talk also about some other issues, too. So I'd like to have you back in the future. I would love to come back. Thank you for the opportunity. It was good chatting with you. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.